So we've been studying the book of James, and we're going to be in this book for as long as it takes until Jesus comes back, or we get through it. And today we're in a very powerful segment of this word that the timeliness of it with these hurricanes is very, very relevant. And some of you, you live in a hurricane. Your life is a hurricane. For some of you, just waking up in the morning, the hurricane is starting. For some of you, you know the phone numbers of some hurricanes. And whenever they call, call her ID. Oh, I don't want to see that hurricane. And you want to quickly, and then you make excuses about why you can't talk. (laughs) I think it ought to, you know, it has all the pre-messages on there that you could just hit one and it says, can I call you later, can't talk now. There should be one in there that's the truth. The truth that says, I don't want to talk to you. And you hit that one, right? (laughs) Anyway, I have my phone up here just to remind you to set your phone on silent so it's not going off in the middle of being fed the Word of God. And uh, you know I like to stand a little more to the side because personally... I hate standing behind a pulpit. I prefer to sit when I'm teaching or I'm all over the floor. It's one or the other. But we are looking, starting at verse 6. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he'll receive anything from the Lord, He's a double-minded man. He's unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat Then it withers the grass, its flowers falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away with his pursuits. Amen. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you in the holy name of Jesus. Lord, you'll bless your word. Lord, please allow me to just receive from you these words that are for you to lead and guide us, to direct us in every way through all the provisions that you have for us. Let each one who can hear, let them hear more deeply than the normal hearing. Let them hear it through the penetration of the heart. Let it sear deeply, Lord, so that none of us today will leave here the way we came here. None of us will be the same when we've gotten up from our seat to praise you and thank you that we were here. I bless as your word goes out, and I bless bless for that, that one new believer today. Just know, Lord, for that one new person. Thank you for them. They are now part of the family of the kingdom of God. In Jesus, amen. And the church says, amen. Amen. Okay, this passage of Scripture, I'm going to focus very heavily on these verses here. Let, verse 9, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation. You know, when you're down, when you don't have as much as the Joneses have, because isn't that the idea? You want to keep up with the Joneses? You have to remember something. Yes, the grass is always greener on the other side, but it still has to be mowed. The family that sits up on the high hillsides, the one is so jealous how beautifully bright in the mornings, the house across the way. And their house is always so dark. And at the end of the day, the family on this other side is always so jealous how their house at the end of the day has such beauty and sunshine, and theirs is always dark. And they're too consumed with what side of the hill they think they sit on because they're too busy looking at what the sun is doing for the other side 
to realize that they're getting their side too. Everyone you know gets jealous, including you. Admit it. Everyone you know has envy. Everyone you know has wish I could speak like you, wish I could look like you, wish I was as skinny as you, wish I was as pretty as you, wish I was as smart as you, wish I was, wish I was, wish I was. The moment these things happen, it's your cue to know you have changed the object of your faith. That's all there is to it. Just like that. And you know I only know one message, so everything I teach you is coming back to that same message. Paul said, I am determined to know nothing among you but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen. He said in 1 Corinthians 1.17 that what? What did he say? I came to preach the gospel. I did not come to baptize. I came to preach the gospel. I didn't come to baptize. I didn't come to start some fancy program. And not with words of wisdom. I'm not here for popularity. I will step on your toes. That's my job. That's what I made. That's my spiritual gifting, is to irritate you. Like it or not. We sat around the pastors, all of us, a week ago Saturday, having a pastoral staff meeting. Pastor Amar decided to go around the room and find out what is your spiritual gift? What is your spiritual gift? And when he came to me, I was like, I just didn't want to say. So I threw it back at him and said, you know, just go ahead. Just you put down what you No, I want to. And he looked right at me just like this. I'm going to show you. He looked at me just like this. You're me. I want to hear it out of your mouth. I said, prophet, my primary spiritual gift, yes, pastor, teacher, but what do you have? In Romans chapter 12, the Holy Father God gave you all your gifts from the moment of your conception. That's what those gifts are in Romans chapter 12. You don't even have to be saved. Those are your gifts from God the Father. In 1 Corinthians Chapter 12, now that you are a born-again Christian, those are all the gifts that came with the package from the Holy Spirit. But in Ephesians chapter 4, if you are going to be called to come out from behind that seat and do something in an office of leadership, then you are apostles, prophets, right? Evangelists, pastors, teachers. See that gift? Those are the five-fold offices of the leadership of the church. Ephesians chapter 4, if you want to know, for a few of you who take real notes. You need to know what is your calling. What is your calling? Now, some of you have callings and you don't even know it. Some of you have callings and you've been dodging it. You've been looking for excuses. Well, I got this job. I got to take care of this person. I got to do this. I got this mortgage over my head. There's nothing you can do to get right before you get with God. The only thing you better make sure is you get right so you don't get left. And this is what's going on in this verse right here. And I'm going to show you there's a really a little bit of a better way this should be written. In verse 10, in verse 10, you have my permission to change this in your Bible. But the rich in his human. You change that to say, but the wealthy. Because for those of you who came to Christian boot camp two Saturdays ago, thank you, God bless you, 26, 28 of you, however many. And for those of you who were too busy and couldn't come, you were traveling or whatever was happening, it was early in the morning. Some of you were sacrilegious, I know. You had to sleep in. That's why some people don't come to church. They're sacrilegious. They can't get up in the morning. Never mind. The difference between rich and wealthy. Wealthy is all of the material things you have, the worth and value of anything that also God calls the manna. In Luke 16, 11, if you have not been faithful with that which is of the 
unrighteous mammon of the world who will entrust you with the true riches. And every one of you who have a Bible that can look at that, I guarantee you, you're going to see the word riches there or true riches in italics. And if you've never known what that's meant or what that's for, that's there because the emphasis when you get into the study of it means those things that are significant in their meaning to God the Father. And what is those? Souls. So therefore, if you have not been faithful with all of the riches and wealth of the world as you perceive it, why would God trust you with souls? That's how that scripture would read. So all the way back to the point, the gift of a prophet doesn't normally make friends. He's there to get in your lunch. Even if it's in your face. So wealthy people versus rich people. You can be poor but be very rich. You can be very wealthy and you are pathetic. And we all know too many superstars with all the fame and fortune that took their own life for the very reason that it couldn't be there to raise them into anything, right? Of course not. For no sooner has the sun risen with the burning heat than it is withered by the grass. You know, James doesn't call himself an apostle, but he certainly was. Everybody knows who James was, right? How many brothers did Jesus have? Mary had more babies after Jesus, people. Several. At least six we know of after Jesus, because the Bible tells us he has four brothers, and he's named, they're all named in the gospel, and it says, and his sisters, which means there's at least two of them. So Mary had at least seven kids that we know of, and James was one of Jesus's half-brothers, and you remember that from in the beginning when I gave you some orientation on how this book's going to go. So as James is describing this, one of the things he's pointing out here is one of the very things his brother was teaching. Turn your Bibles into Matthew chapter 6. I believe it's there on the way into church this morning. Linda and I were having fun. She was reading the Bible to me. Go to Matthew 6 and... Pick it up in verse 25, as Jesus is talking to people. Okay, all honesty, all honesty, show of hands. All honesty. How many of you know you're a worrier? Now how many of you know you're a liar? Okay, you're a worrier. Some of you worry that you're a worrier. You should spend more time wanting to be a warrior instead of a worrier. So Jesus is in the middle of this, talking to people about their worrying. And this is not a message about worry, but boy, is there enough meat in the Bible about be anxious for nothing. It's Philippians 4, 6, right? Be anxious for nothing. The word nothing hyphenated means no thing. So there is no thing worth worrying. The definition of fear, F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real. So the minute you fear something, it's probably not real anyway. But Jesus goes on and he starts talking about, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat, what you'll drink, what you'll put in your body. Because in that day, eating, drinking, and what you wear were the three predominant concerns that everybody had. Because they knew they could lay on a rock anywhere. Bible says it would be better to live on the rooftop of a house, right? So outdoor living was certainly part of biblical days. The roof was considered a room in the house. So all of you at least have two-story homes if you have one story. You have the story and the truth. 
Pat sells two-story houses all the time. She tells them the truth and then the other story. Okay? <laughs> so Jesus goes on to tell them, is not your life worth more than food? Isn't your body worth more than drink? Isn't your body worth more than clothing? You're worrying about the wrong thing. Say that. You're worrying about the wrong thing. Say that. Worrying about the wrong thing. Remind yourself to learn that phrase. You're worrying about the wrong thing. I've spent years in the prison systems. That's one of the key lines they say in prisons. You're worried about the wrong thing. That means mind your own stupid business. If it's not in your business, it's none of your business. Because you're worried about the wrong thing. That's your cue that that's it. You don't get another warning. So you need to learn that line. You're worrying about the wrong thing. Jesus keeps going on. Look at the birds of the air. They're not freaking out over what am I going to eat. God knows what they need. Which of you, look at verse 27, which of you by worrying can add a single cubit to your stature? In other words, a cubit is about 18 inches. But let alone, let's just go with one. Which of you by worrying can add even an inch to how tall you are? So if you can't even accomplish that by worrying, then your worrying is not worth anything, which means you can't change anything. With worry, change is nothing, except you drag a bunch of other people down with you usually, because most people don't know how to manage a worrier. So if you draw them into you, you're like a big, what do you call those in the water, and they're sucking everybody in, right? It's like Drano, you know what I'm talking about. Now here's the line that James is copying his brother. He starts out in verse 28. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not as arrayed as one of these. We'll stop there for a moment. Why did Jesus use that illustration? Because if any of you, especially if any of you who like a little bit of a microscopic look at things, take the leaf of a lily and put it under a microscope, there's no seams. You take a piece of the finest silk in the world, put it under a microscope, and it looks like burlap. Nothing but a bunch of that. But you put a lily under the microscope, and it's seamless. It's strandless. It's perfect. And then Jesus goes on, and here's the line that connects to what James was saying. Now, if God so clothes the grass in the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Understand what these little terms, when you understand Eastern culture and Western culture, they're very different. You have the Occidental and the Eastern culture, in the Occidental culture, they see things very different. Exaggeration is the norm. And illustration always means something with profound depth. And in that day, what Jesus is talking about that James was copying, he's saying, if the clothes, the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven... You know, whenever they traveled in a caravan, they brought their little baking ovens with them. They'd put a couple of rocks out. They'd set it on it. They'd pull some grass, put it underneath it, set it on fire, get the inside of the oven hot, and then they'd bake some bread. You with me? But when they were in a hurry, there was no time to work with this little Susie Baker oven like that. They took the grass and they put it inside the oven and lit it, shut the door, heat up the oven faster. And then they would quickly hurry, because they got to get out of there. Could be running for some important reason or hurrying for some important reason, which is why today God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven. They already understood the illustration. How do you deal with things that normally you worry about, you panic about, you fret over? Get your knickers in a bunch. 
James is copying this line. And he's using this in order for us to understand for no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat then it withers the grass. Its flowers fails and its beauty appearance perishes. So you see James is taking a more embellishing approach to what Jesus has said which brings it all back to the very first point of this lesson. If you take your eyes off the object of your faith of what Jesus Christ finished on the cross and you begin placing it on, oh, your house is damaged. Oh, your bank account isn't strong enough. Oh, somebody spoke behind your back. Oh, somebody got the promotion and you didn't get it. Oh, you don't have enough money to fix this thing. Oh, am I going to be so sick now? Ah, uh, what? Ah, uh, oh, what? What? And you start becoming consumed by this. You are totally living outside the realm of faith. And this is what James is saying. Go back up to verse 6. But let him ask in faith. He's talking about faith in the finished work of what Jesus provided for us when he said in John 19.30, it is finished. What is finished? What do you need? It's finished. And until you believe in me, you're going to go through a grinding struggle mentally, emotionally, and once you get that train rolling, it starts to affect you physically. Your body is the result of what you stuff in your mouth and what comes from your head. People, we are children of the Most High God. Our dad is God. How do you not just can't even hold still when you get that inside of you? And you sit there praising the Lord. Give Christ to Jesus. Yes, how are you old? Come now. Come now. Even the brother says in the word, come, now is the time to reason. Now is the time of the Lord. <sighs> you just walk around with sandbags in your pockets. You bury yourself in burdens. Hoist one on this shoulder, hoist one on this shoulder, and you just drag yourself around. Burden one, burden two, and if one falls off, then right, oh, help me with my burden. Put it back on me. Why would I want to help you? Are you out of your mind? You know the minute somebody calls you on the phone and says, can I borrow $1,100? They're in big trouble. Because if $1,100 would solve your problems, you have no idea how stupid you are. Call me and tell me you need 10000 20000 then I'm going to think you got a head on your shoulders. Something might be going on that really matters. But please, don't call and ask me to stand here with you and see how many bubbles we can make. The men should be chuckling at that one. James is telling us right here, our life is over like that. I wish I had one of those big snaps. My brother, Rob, remember Rob and Angela? Hey, Rob and Angela, I know they're watching. They're always watching us. He's got a snap that's like, well, that's what I mean. Like that, your life is done. Now, those of us who are already in our 60s, next month I'm going to be 68. I know I don't look it because I only feel 25, and I can outrun you. But the point is, my wife has enough trouble keeping up with me. <laughs> but the point is, I expect to see my 104th birthday. I fully expect to be this guy, because that's all I think. Not this guy. You know, like the old Jews, you know, when it was time to go to synagogue, this was them. You know, oh, we're going to be with God. And when synagogue was over, they'd leave like this. Oh, we have to leave God now. 
You don't leave him anymore. He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. He lives inside you. He's always there with you. Yes, amen. Yes and amen. And his promises, like Candace and the team were singing, his promises are yes and amen. Oh, Jesus, my Savior, tower and refuge and strength, let every breath, all that I have, never forsake your name. Oh, and we go on, shout to the Lord. Oh, ye saints of the Lord, shout. When was the last time you said, I love you, Jesus? Do it. Get out of your stupid grave and do it. You're in a rut. You know what a rut is, don't you? It's a grave with both ends kicked out. That's it. Stop pre-burying yourself. They sing. Sing to God. Tell him how much I love you. Get excited. When you were a little kid, you came home with a coloring and mommy put it on the refrigerator. Didn't you get excited? Well, what do you think God wants to do when you rejoice in his name? God loves nothing more than when you read his word back to him. When you read your Bible, read out loud. Read out loud. Because life is over that fast. The next thing you know, oh, I'm in my 50s. Oh, I'm in my 60s. Oh, I'm in my 70s. I laugh at that. Now, I got corrected by Linda a little while ago. Because the minute I was in my 40s, I would always say, I'm going to be 50. People go, really? And the minute I hit, the minute I hit 51, I started saying, I'm going to be 60. And then the minute I hit 60, I've been telling everybody, I'm going to be 70. She's like, why don't you tell people your real age? You make them think you're older. I want them to think I'm older because I can't wait. Because I know the older I get, the closer I'm getting and the smarter I'm getting. And then I can leave those cares behind. I'm further away from them. Aren't you? Are you still just dragging them right along with you? You're too busy looking for a sale at Home Depot so you can put them on a cart and make it easier to pull more. You get jealous for the stupidest things. Oh, my husband, I saw him this. Oh, my wife, I saw her that. Really? What is that on your finger? Is it fake or real? Get it on or take it off. But the reason you start talking about the endless circle is there's no beginning, there's no end. You talk about that love. If you're getting jealous of each other as a couple, one of you needs a good whack in the head <laughs> by the other one because you're both causing it. He's not giving her the confidence that you shouldn't have to worry about such a stupid thing. And she's not looking at her husband and going into 1 Peter, should I have to read it to you? 1 Peter, huh, chapter 3, ladies, I'll read the last part of it. So that by the conduct of your chaste behavior, you will sway the heart of your husband without a word out of your mouth. Half of you think if it isn't the words out of your mouth, he doesn't hear me. If you want him to hear you, act like the most godly woman there is, and then God will go, hey boy, hey boy, hey boy, and he'll give him them. He'll get them. He'll get them. And James is driving this point home. Hey, stupid. Hey, knucklehead. Your life's going to be over so fast. You think what's important is important? Man, are you missing out on what is important. I guess he could have written in there, you're worried about the wrong thing. If you have a sickness... Get excited because you're going to become a testimony for someone who can't seem to figure out how to get over their sickness. If you lost something significant, get excited that you're going to become a testimony for somebody who lost less than you. If you're going to be someone who gets looked past for another person who you think isn't as qualified as you, then be the best toilet washer there is and make everybody jealous. Do you know the other day, yesterday, was it yesterday or the day before we were in Kohl's? And the manager was helping Linda at the counter to fix up something that I was 
quite thrilled they were going to help us with. But I had to use the bathroom. I said, where's the men's room? She says, it's right there. I go, oh, convenient. I was literally four steps. It was right there. You think I could have just opened my eyes, right? I came out of the bathroom, and I had to say, please, I have to tell you, thank you so much that you have such clean bathrooms. I am so grateful because I am so fussy. I never stop at a gas station when I'm on the highway. You know me, sometimes I'd be traveling thousands of miles at a time. If I can't find a Hampton, you get it? Where I know the bathroom is going to be clean. If I can't find a Holiday Inn Express, if I can't find a nice hotel, a Wyndham, I'll hold it. I'll hold it. You girls, I'm sorry, you have to sit on anything. But us guys, when you got to sit down, I'm fussy. And if you don't care enough about cleaning your toilets the way they ought to be clean, then you have a bigger problem. You can't say, oh, that's not important. Yes, it is. That spider underneath is going to come and bite you. <laughs> Read that one. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. That's what he's going to start out with in verse 12. But blessed is the sister or the brother who isn't consumed with the attitude of what I have, who likes me, and what else is what that makes and dictates how I'm going to feel now. So I'm going to give you a closing lesson here. Pay attention. It's a little reminder for the Christian boot camp attendees. You have to make a choice. When something happens, are you going to be a thermostat or a thermometer? Which one? Now, you all know, come on, we all grew up as little kids. You remember how a thermometer worked, right? You shake it, you get the mercury down, right? You rub it on your arm a little bit, mercury goes up, put it in your mouth when your mom comes in, and now you get to stay home from school because you must have a fever. I did that once with my mom. I told the group, I said, my mom said, I know your fever ain't 106, so what'd you rub it on? <laughs> and if you put a match at the end of it, it blows up the end of those. That was just for fun. But a thermometer reacts. It reacts to cold or hot. It just reacts. A thermostat, what happens? You set it at 73. It goes down to 71 and poosh, the air conditioner kicks on. If it goes up to 76, I got it backwards, right? The heater comes on, then the air conditioner. But it regulates and it keeps the temperature within two degrees. Do you know why a therm thermostat keeps the temperature within two degrees? Does anybody know that? Because two degrees is the biological notion of the brain that recognizes temperature change. The body can only feel a temperature change every two degrees. So in reality, the thermostat, if somebody's getting under your collar, you're starting to get a little heat, turn on the air conditioner. Just start praising them and blessing them. If somebody is getting a little too cold-shouldered for you, not giving you the warmy, hoogie-huggy, likey-lovey that you think you deserve, giving you the recognition you should get, Turn it on and warm them up. Kill them with your kindness. Love them, love them, love them. You know what it says in, 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 in the scripture in chapter 12 in uh, Romans? It tells us to, you, what? what happens? If your enemy, he's messing with you, bless him. Get out of God's way. Because God is going to pour the heaping coals on him to deal with it better than you were going to. So get out of the way. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. If he's hungry, give him something to eat. In doing so, ah, you're going to show. Be a thermostat. Stop being a thermometer. And you can almost tell when somebody asks you to do them a favor, if somebody asks you for something and you're not that comfortable with it, This might be the Lord testing you to see what you would be willing to do. Because he's going to spring a good one on you. If you wouldn't do that, oh, I got one for you. You're going to wish you were doing that. 
Because I can tell you right now, we got a building here that could have been ripped to shreds pretty easily. And it wasn't. Those who are all thanking the Lord. Really? Imagine those who are applying an effort to maintain this, how thankful they are. Amen? So stop thinking about how important your life is to dictate how you'll feel. Keep your focus on the finished work of the cross, on what Jesus said is finished, it is done. Trust him and believe him. Remember I taught you there's only four ways God answers prayer. He either says no. What's the next one? Class? Slow. Slow down. Don't go running too fast. There's things you don't know yet. He says, what's next, class? Grow. He says, no. He says, slow. He says, no. Wait, I am building you up and training you and teaching you through this matter that is happening, so you're growing through this with me right now. And finally, the last thing God says is what? Go. Go. He says, no, slow, grow, or go. And when he says go, Yes, you're in his will, but that doesn't mean there's not going to be some bumps in the road. There will be, but they're part of the training. They're like slowing down for the speed bump in the neighborhood. It just helps keep the children a little bit safer and the parents a little more peace of mind that their kids are a little safer because the car can't go quite so fast. So God knows when to tell you, no, slow, grow, and go. He already finished everything we need. And he's looking for you to take the opportunity to be a real thermostat to things instead of being a reacting thermometer to things that would really drive you nuts. And the next time we pick up in James, we're going to go on and find out a little bit more about living the Christian life. I love you. I love you. Say, I love you. I love you. Look at your neighbor. Say, I love you. You better start telling people I love you. Praise the name of Jesus. Papa.